his, thank you. Um, and his uh, recent work appears in Studies in 18th Century Culture, 19th Century Gender Studies, and A Modern. He is currently working on a book manuscript entitled Insecure Immunity, Inoculation and Anti-Vaccination, 1720 to 1898. And the thing that I'm most excited about and the thing that I value out of so many things uh, about Travis's multifaceted contributions to our scholarly, our intellectual, our digital, our emotional communities, um, and many of these contributions can be found on his online portfolio, which I'm dropping in chat because I will shamelessly plug this till the day I die, um, uh, is how Travis creates multiple points of access for his students and his peers inside and outside of the academy, whatever that means. Um, this drive of creating access, not just in his research, but in his public facing intellectual work, and the types of advocacies he does and performs at ASEX, Bigger Six, and other online and in-person spaces, models just what an incredible humanist ethos Travis has. He is a scholar whose research and praxis align so thoroughly in his commitments to creating accessible spaces to think against straight and ableist hegemonies. And it is inspiring and galvanizing AF. So if you would please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Lau. Oh my God, uh, how do I follow that up, Jared? Um, I will thank you properly in time. Um, but before I start, uh, I am also going to drop uh, the accessibility copy again. This is a Google Drive version um, that you can, oh no, I can, uh, if you can uh, re-enable the chat briefly, yes. Uh, you can now see the script of the talk. It may look slightly different than the one that you had before uh, that was up. I just changed a few sentences, uh, but this is the full script of the talk for accessibility and I will begin. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, so I want to first express my gratitude to Rebecca Bullard for the very generous invitation to address the community formed around the open digital seminar for 18th century studies. To create community from afar, means so much in these conditions we're all living through. I also want to celebrate Elaine McGurr uh, stepping in as chair of Odd Sex and moderating this conversation today, as well as Jared generously introducing me as a fellow queer crit scholar in the field. I want to express how much this all means to me as a junior disabled member of our field, still trying to figure out how to navigate the different conversations and spaces that I've had the great privilege of participating in. The truth is that my work hasn't always been welcome or even legible, but to be delivering this talk now is a testament that I'm right where I'm supposed to be, among colleagues that I respect and admire. I want to thank you all for choosing to be here at yet another Zoom event. I know we are all overextended, overworked, and overwhelmed by the responsibilities and necessities of trying to survive a pandemic without sufficient resources and support, often not just for ourselves, but for our vulnerable loved ones and for our students and colleagues. Thank you for holding space with me. In the spirit of access, I would like to start with my usual accessibility check-in, a uh, practice that I learned from my very dear colleague in disability studies, Alison Kafer. Uh, during this seminar, please feel welcome to inhabit your body mind as fully as possible. Sit, stand, stretch, stim, step away, switch off your camera if that is what you need to do. I acknowledge that we arrive in this virtual space with different needs. So if I can make this talk accessible to you in any way, please don't hesitate to let me know. While I'm grateful that captioning is available, I have also dropped the link, which I will do again, if you don't mind activating chat briefly. This is the access copy, uh, full accessibility copy of the script uh, of this talk in the chat should you need to follow along. I welcome your engagement in the chat during the Q&A or by email later on if that's more accessible to you. Oh, no. I have long resonated with Tanya Tchaikovsky's definition of access as the quote interpretive relationship between bodies. And the goal in my scholarship, in my classroom, in this very talk is to enable that interpretive relationship as much as possible for the body minds that share this space. The translation to the virtual has made access simultaneously more at the center of event programming and pedagogy, but also the first to be neglected. In our rush to return to normal, access measures that were introduced during the pandemic are already being dismissed and forgotten, even as we return to in-person classes and conferences. I want to stress that access is never optional. It is not a set of criteria we check off to virtue signal an empty claim of diversity. 
It is also not a thing that disabled people should have to beg or fight for when a truly accessible space benefits everyone in the room. This is a collective ongoing effort in which everyone benefits, even as there is no perfectly accessible space, but one that we aspire to as a horizon of possibility. The formation of odd sex itself is an imagining of a more accessible 18th century studies, period. In the time that I have today, I want to develop some of the threads from a round table that I organized with Dr. Madeline Sutherland Meyer as the co-chairs of the Disability Studies Caucus for the 2019 ASEX annual meeting. In conceiving this panel, we wanted to think about disabilities incompatibility and resistance to the concept of improvement, even as disability remained frequently the subject of quote unquote needed improvement. Disabled body minds, problems and inadequacies would of course become the justification for later 19th and 20th century eugenic interventions from sterilization to institutionalization to genocide. Quote unquote, we are improving the human race by purging undesirable populations of the sick and disabled. As Rosemary Garland Thompson has suggested, these eugenic impulses persist in the forms of prenatal testing and gene editing technologies like CRISPR, all of which offer a tantalizing future of a world without disability. However, if disability studies as a field has taught us anything, it is that disabled people have been resilient in order to survive. They have demonstrated what the cost is of improvement, so often represented as an unquestionable good. As the participants of the roundtable on disability and improvement have shown in their now article-length essays in Studies in 18th Century Studies, historical approaches to disability complicate not only what the 18th century project of improvement looked like and felt like, but also the very category of disability at a moment when the term was only just coming into being within a constellation of other terms that described physical or cognitive difference. Scholars of early modern and 18th century disability have refused disability studies tendency toward an uncritically deterministic view of the past that teleologically results in pathology or what David Mitchell and Sharon Snyder have described as disability becoming the quote unquote master trope of human disqualification. Leonard Davis's now standard account of the contemporaneous development of the 19th century statistical norm and eugenic thinking, for instance, does not take into account the kind of lexical or ideological inconsistencies surrounding terms in this period like defect, anomaly, monstrosity, constitution, or temperament that 18th century scholars like David Turner, Felicity Nussbaum, Helen Deutsch, Chris Mouncey, and Jason Farr have parsed in terms of the found formation of disability in relation to other facets of identity like gender, race, and sexual sexuality. Methodologically, such inconsistencies of thought offer us entry points for offering historically nuanced crip critique of the seemingly airtight ableism of the past. To that end, I want to think more about genealogical approaches that excavate etymological histories of terms we think we know to then reveal their discursive versatility and semantic vagueness. What Grayson Brillmeyer has described as a critical disability approach to the archive that, quote, does not provide a concrete solution to archival absences, but as a methodology committed to working with the communities which we research and frames research paradigms practices and techniques with the complexity of disabled experiences, while also embracing the fluidity of sick and disabled experiences, how records only capture pieces of disability, highlighting how these moments are spatially, temporally, and materially contingent. And those are Grayson's words. What does it actually mean to claim CRIP in the archive and to look for it in the archive and in its gaps? Does disabilities polysemy prior to its formation as a legible politicized identity uh, category challenge, will we often take for granted in invoking disability now? We can be strategic here in our presentism, not simply reject the belief that we shouldn't look for disability in the past because it did not yet exist in the same ways that we understand it now, but instead boldly inhabit the crip epistemologies and crip poetics of 18th century thinking and living that have long been discarded as unvaluable or unworthy of study. As I've suggested in my short piece for Disability Studies Quarterly, what comes quote unquote before the norm 
and medicalization that predetermines almost every way we tend to talk about disability now. As I have suggested in my brief shout outs to other scholars, this work is not new. I do not seek to claim novelty or possession over the subfield. Rather, I want to acknowledge how so much work in 18th century studies has actually been about disability issues without necessarily being named as such, without the legitimacy of state of the field essays written about it, or without some field controversy sanctioning this work as worthy or real. It has really become apparent to me how much fields of studies are uh, fields of study are bound to institutions that realize them as fields because enough people take them seriously as valuable work that needs to have a future. For a moment, we can consider the perversity of pondering whether or not work on disabled people already presumed not to have a future should have a place at the collective academic table that seems more rickety than ever. I've overheard numerous times during past conferences surprise about the existence of a disability caucus, which is one of the youngest caucuses in ASEX established in 2014. The caucus is the culmination of over a decade of advocacy since 2004 by Leonard Davis and Chris Gabbard, George Haggerty, Paul Kelleher, Jared Richman, Chris Mouncey, Stan Booth, Jason Flar, and more recently myself, Madeline Sutherland Meyer, Jared Wahey, Hannah Chaskin, and now Annika Mann and Emily Stanbeck, who have worked to ensure disability appears on the program and is taken seriously as part of how ASEX operates as an annual conference and organization. That was a long way of saying we've been here for a while. We're here, we're crip, get used to it. But I digress, back to improvement. I recently revisited Paul Slack's predictably Whiggish monograph, The Invention of Improvement, Oxford University Press 2014, and was struck by the way it opens. And these are Slack's words, quote, improvement means gradual, piecemeal, but cumulative betterment. It can refer to mental capacities as much as material circumstances and to the capabilities of individuals as well as to the resources of whole societies and countries. By the beginning of the 18th century, the quest of improvement distinguished England from other countries. It had become part of the collective mentality and it made England distinctive, end quote. According to Slack, improvement is what made Britain modern precisely because improvement achieved the status of a national project that made it exceptional quote, governing how the English saw themselves and the condition of the nation to which they belonged and their expectations of how it might alter in the future. For Slack, the 16th century attempts at improvement began to become increasingly a paternalistic in policy and ideology. They promoted, quote unquote, the common wheel and thus facilitated improvement at the local and national levels. It is the scale and promise of improvement that catches my attention here. It's generalizable capacity to encompass everything from cognitive function to infrastructure to foreign policy within this narrative of it gets better slowly but surely. It is also an imperative. We will get better if even by force. But what does it mean to commit to such a project predicated on the great expectation of mental, physical, national, cultural, economic, and social improvement. What happens to what fails or even in refuses to improve if improvement comes to define what it means to participate in public life and what it means to see oneself as British? Does claiming Britishness then necessitate a commitment to improvement? I also want to think about the temporal inflection of improvement, a processual working toward a quote unquote, better future by bettering the conditions of today in, as Slack says, gradual, piecemeal, cumulative way. Improvement seems, improvement seems utopian in its imagination of a set of possible futures imagined as better or more beautiful and aspirational tomorrow that necessitates sacrifice, labor, and investment today. The other unspoken assumption here is of linear progress the inevitable making good over time, even if it is in small, disparate increments, not always perceptible. This raises even more questions. 
What metrics of goodness or speed constitute true improvement? Who gets to determine and track these metrics? Who or what gets to improve? And what is deemed not worth improving or impossible to improve? If improvement's earliest deployment in the 15th and 16th centuries from the Anglo-French emploi to turn to profit and from the Latin prosum of advantage was in terms of maximizing profit, specifically from the land, how does this capitalistic impulse shape the disciplinary, punitive, and therapeutic measures eventually used to repair or eliminate disability in the name of improving the general stock of humankind? Disability studies has taught me to ask serious questions here about the stakes of this imagined improved future to which a nation becomes committed and defines itself. The historical track record is pretty damning. Such expectations of improvement have predictably been disastrous for disabled people. Take for instance, Nazi Germany's T4 Aktion project, which led to the mass euthanasia of over 300,000 disabled people in the name of racial hygiene. The medical model of disability underpinning these eugenic movements frame disabled bodies as individual problems that are improved by medicine. The fundamental idea here is that disability is an error, flaw, or lack to be corrected, or at least improved into something adjacent to healthy normalcy. Unsurprisingly, the chronically ill and the more permanently disabled directly undermine the prospect of improving health or improving the outcomes of treatment. The professionalization of medicine and the Foucauldian birth of the clinic during the 18th and 19th centuries intensified the ways in which bodies became sites of improvement, increasingly more subject to state intervention and management that will culminate in the highly bureaucratized public health initiatives in the Victorian period. If we take Foucault's claim seriously, his sloppy historicism aside, the clinical gaze reorganizes the body's terrain from a more holistic entity into subdivided improvable space, tissues, organs, organ systems, now literally and figuratively exposed to the physician's eye and its observational technologies. Phys physical and cognitive defects that could not be ameliorated or eliminated also signaled defects in therapeutic regimens and curative practices that in turn could be improved and perfected. Disability and chronic illness helped to improve medicine's efficacy and efficiency to the extent that it was often produced in subjects, particularly marginalized ones like the enslaved, the poor, and the criminal. I've been meditating on these histories in relation to what Alison Kafer has described as the curative imaginary. Quote, an understanding of disability that not only expects and assumes intervention, but also cannot imagine or comprehend anything other than intervention, end quote. Disabled body minds are presumed to be out of time, both in the sense of displacement from normative development and inhabitation of time, and also running out of time as lives presumed not to have viable futures, much as Lee Edelman has suggested about queer life in no future. If the nationalizing project of improvement necessitated medicine's own shifts in theory and practice toward more sophisticated interventions. How might this shift, of, shift in our understanding of disability's place in the 18th century as the unruly matter that not only resists improvement, but reveals improvements ideological assumptions of imagining a world without disease and disability? Is disability thus antithetical to the enlightenment project of improvement? These questions have, and continue to haunt my work, especially as disability is becoming trendier as a topic after decades of dismissal and exclusion. Part of my attempt to answer these questions has been to turn to what has become the current center of my book project on the history of anti-vaccination and immunity in the 18th and 19th centuries, the shifting conceptions of childhood and childhood development. Because I've been interested in the different ways children get co-opted into national narratives of well-being and progress, the controversy, controversy surrounding vaccination as literally making children, quote unquote, as dumb as cows, feel particularly salient as they are fixated on the foreclosure of children's futures by cognitive disability. 
The idea that vaccination used cowpox as a substitute for smallpox in the production of an immune response raised questions among vaccine hesitant and vaccine res resistant families about the potential disabling of their child from a deliberate infection that crossed human and animal species boundaries. Were their children's health being improved or sabotaged permanently? At the very core of this, of this is a deep arresting fear of disability and its potential to undo the expectations of childhood development as part of the individual and collective responsibility of British improvement. The other place we see this attachment of improvement to children is of course in education. It is unsurprising that one of the first broader uses of improvement was Francis Bacon's advancement of learning in 1605. William Hay, disabled parliamentarian and man of letters who cites Bacon throughout deformity and essay, frames his own spinal curvature not as weakness or liability, but rather the source of moral and physical improvement beginning in childhood after botched attempts by his family. In this remarkable defense of disability, or what disability and act, the disability activists and thinkers might call a case for disability gain, Hay, cri uh, Hay crips the notion of improvement by insisting on its formative value rather than negative. Quote, deformity is a protection to a man's health and person, which strange as it may appear, are better defended by feebleness than strength. If this fundamental aspect of his body mind does not hinder or diminish his capacities to participate in public life, but in fact enhances them, Hay insists then that disability offers an unexpected gift, the opportunity for improvement. For quote, this difference of behavior towards me hath given me the strongest idea of the force of education and taught me to set a right value upon it. I remain ambivalent about the fact that Hay must frame disability's value in terms of self-improvement. But I also find it remarkable that part of the cultural narrative that he is rewriting is disability's supposed lack of contribution to the larger project of improvement that defines Britishness. If disability signals a kind of stasis or refusal to improve, Hay reimagines a disability that is dynamic and improving in different ways beyond simply the physical. Hay, after all, even concludes his essay by consenting to the donation of his body to science, believing his, quote, carcass may be of eminent service to mankind. I desire my body may be open and examined by eminent surgeons that mankind may be informed of its effect, end quote. Even in death, his body may yet improve the work of medicine that may then improve the quality of life for other disabled people. But is this magnanimity? or a commentary on what it takes for a disabled person to be seen as a contributing member of society invested in its improvement. I will defer to the expertise of my colleagues who are working on the histories of disabled education and childhood disability, but I will conclude with a few questions that I want to think about with you. Andrew O'Malley has argued that, quote, for children to participate successfully in the new ideological project of the period they had to be rendered into subjects whose energies could be controlled and effectively harnessed, end quote. If that ideological project here is improvement, disabled children frustrated attempts at such harnessing, particularly toward productivity and labor in an increasingly industrialized Britain. I'm thinking here of the damning critique Letitia Landon offers in the poem, The Factory, where industrial labor literally disabled children who then, quote unquote, make of many an English home one long and living tomb. Given that medical practice, and these are O'Malley's words, given that, quote, medical practice, the management of children and the good of society intersect for the first time in the 18th century, and the family, the domestic microcosm of society, becomes the center for the articulation of these concerns, disability disrupted the improvement of all of these domains and their capacity to improve others. The proliferation of advice books and treatises on the medical management of children produced a child subject that could be disciplined, but disability underscored the otherness of childhood as an anarchic state of being potentially, potentially unmanageable. I wonder then if disabled education helps us better understand the fantasies behind improvement while also offering us insight into how disabled children often resisted the disciplinary strategies of 18th century education that perpetually infantilized them.
I'm thinking here of Samuel Foote and his knack for mimicry that would later come to define his theatrical success. His, undis his undisciplined behavior would have him disenrolled by Oxford. And I wonder to what extent his later physical disability invited questions about his education and formation as a young man. To what degree did Foote's playing up his lost leg for comedy resist 18th century expectations of improvement while also affirm the need for disabled people to improve their conditions? I'm of course curious about blind and deaf education, but more specifically education for the cognitively disabled and how they might have measured something like improvement or work towards some fiction of a redeemable idiocy or feeble-mindedness that rendered a disabled person acceptable or even a success within an 18th century culture of improvement. Thus, to crypt the enlightenment is to consistently question the ableism inherent to its defining project of improvement while also recovering crip ways of living and being that were always already antithetical to the period's regimes of compulsory able-bodiedness. To put this in the brilliant words of Jason Farr, quote, to crip the 18th century is to interrogate the ideological fissures and those exclusionary discursive formations. To crip the enlightenment also entails finding new ways to conceptualize the period to identify stereotypical representations of impairment as deprivation, to be sure, but also to draw attentions, uh, draw attention to portrayals of crip futurity. And with that, I'm going to end there. And I'm very interested in what you all are thinking and the Q and A ahead. Thanks so much, everyone. I think I have re-enabled the chat. Uh, yes, I have. Thank you, Declan, for testing. And everyone should also be able to unmute themselves if they want to ask a question. So I'm going to keep chat up on one side and also look for hands up. So I'm going to put you all on gallery view to make that easier. Uh, Declan is clapping. I'm going to try and withhold my chair's privilege to give people a chance to ask questions. Uh, Christopher Nagel says uh, that he needs to head out, but Travis, thank you. Your work is, is always inspiring, and I can't wait to read more. And Travis is faster than I am at responding to the chat. Joseph Hone, who is going to help me with the chat, has had his internet explode. So please be patient if I don't see right away. Um, pop it in the chat as well. Uh, any questions for Travis? Let's sink in. It was a rich, wonderfully rich paper. I think Andrew McKendry has a Oh, question. thank you. Oh, that is a hand up. I thought that was clapping again. Sorry, Andrew. Uh, go ahead. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for that talk, which I thought it was a great talk. Uh, I think uh, you are really on point with this connection between a kind of like epochal ableism and the idea, you know, the defining idea of improvement uh, in the Enlightenment. So, I mean, that made a lot of sense to me. Um, the thing I wanted to ask is if you could connect it to another discourse. Um, and I was wondering if you could connect it a little bit to, to the discourse of secularism. Uh, just because, you know, we usually see, you know, the 18th century as a, as a period of kind of secularization. Um, and I asked this for, I guess, a couple reasons. Um, one is, you know, because the term disability at the time was applied uh, substantially, you know, to Catholics and, and dissenters and that kind of thing. And it always seemed, they seemed like such strange bedfellows, though many dissenters, of course, uh, had disabilities. Um, but they kind of shared a similar relationship to the law. So I ask it for that reason. And also because it seems like the idea of kind of fixing the world and repairing the world is a distinctively secular idea uh, that is a kind of turn away from older visions of the fall. Um, and Joanna Picciotto has this great book about how in the 17th century, the idea, as the idea of the fall changed, the promise of repairing the world, of like fixing it, you know, uh, became conceivable. 
So I guess, um, like in, in your research, was there any sense that this is a this is a kind of a, a secular um, trajectory or process or anything, or or am I wrong about that, or or is there is there an a religious element to it? They seem like such strange topics to put together. I realize, but the period, you know, I can't help but think of that for the period. That's such a great question and one that um, I. I will absolutely admit my limited knowledge of, but my my instinct in terms of a response is to think a little bit about the transition between religious models of disability as a kind of divine trial uh, or a kind of monstrosity, a, an omen of some sort of community or an individual failure to a more medicalized model of disability that will try to pathologize it and see it as a fixable thing. Um, when, when I'm thinking about these older religious models, they have a sort of juridical element to it, but they also have a moralizing element to it. And I, I can't help but think about the 16th and 17th century uh, uh, theories of maternal imprinting that then of course become super popular still in the 18th century uh, of women who during pregnancy for any reason are exposed, exposed to certain stimuli that then imprint on their child. There's still that kind of element of blame uh, and religious moralism that kind of gets attached to it. So when I think about whether or not this is a secular phenomenon, my instinct is to think about how that actually went right in line with a lot of the ableism that was happening, where it was simply backed up with medicine and uh, not as much in terms of spirituality. I have, um, I'm thinking here too of David Turner's book on um, 18th century disability. And David makes this really important point that uh, this trajectory toward a more secular uh, 18th century nation does not necessarily mean that there's a jettisoning of religious frameworks. They, they start to coexist and they start to sort of feed one another. By the time we get to say the Victorian period, I'm really struck by how discourses of things like um, madness or um, nervous diseases have both a distinctly religious element to it that justified sometimes really invasive spiritual and medical interventions, uh, but also how those uh, much of the kind of counter discourse uh, to the rise of something like um, anesthesia or more, of more chemical means of grappling with something like pain, for instance, um, was also sometimes understood in religious ways. Um, and I, I can't help but think that those two things continue to coexist and become, I guess, parts of one another rather than just giving way uh, to just secularism kind of dominating the discourse. But I, I really, I find this point so helpful and to think about the role of the dissenter as problematizing this assumption of a, an approvable world. Um, I, I have to do more work on this and I'm actually curious what, what places you would go to to sort of flesh out this connection more, more fully. Um, as you can tell, my, my mind is very much in the medical side of things uh, and all things spiritual need to be of consideration because I also feel like with my anti-vax project, um, that is another one of the links of continuity I want to make between historical anti-vaxxers and contemporary anti-vaxxers. So thank you so much. What a great question. Elaine, I think you're still muted. It's the first one this season. We'll, we'll, we'll get better at this, I promise. I've um, been on six different platforms today. I've forgotten how to unmute myself. Sorry about that. Uh, nice. Just, I was saying that as we were waiting for more people to generate questions, I was going to read out some of the well-deserved praise in the chat. Jason Pearl says, that was great, Travis. Can't wait to read more of this project. And just cowing, uh, right? And just cowing says, "Thank you so much." As a 19th century lurker, this was incredibly generative for me to think about how to apply crypt theory and methodology to historical contexts. Yes, as an inter as a as a lurker in the 19th century, I feel like I very much empathize with that experience. I did find I thought the reach of your paper was was one of the real richnesses of it as you're tracing that rhetoric of improvement. Um, that, was, that was what I wanted to, to ask you to press more on, and that's the, the defining of what constitutes improvement. Um, your example of Hay, who's challenging 
a kind of model of improvement, which is a normative body or an, you know, an unfolded body. Um, how much explicit challenging of what constitutes improvement have you found in your sources? This is a tough one because I feel like one of the great limits of my knowledge of the period is that um, I have I have many literary sources, but I don't have significant amounts of life writing. Um, and I'm thinking a lot of Chris Gabbard's work and uh, the talk that he gave and the piece that ended up in um, uh, Studies for 18th Century uh, Culture uh, about this the one need for us to think beyond disability as metaphor, but actually as lived experience and how on the one hand, how limited our archive is um, and how much we need to revisit the archive to think about works we think we know in crip ways. Um, this is why I brought up uh, Grayson Brillmeyer's piece about critical disability studies in the archive. And something that Grayson helped me understand um, is that I felt, I think when I first started working in the field, I, I, had, I had this great anxiety that I, I just didn't have a corpus of material that I could really work with. And I didn't know what to do with the sort of haunting absences in the archive. Um, and uh, Grayson said to me at one point and in that piece um, said that what a good uh, crip methodology should do is embrace those absences and to think about what, what the, what kinds of conditions and circumstances produce those absences and how as, as, a, as a scholarly community, we're, we're just now learning how to read Crip in the archive. So that's a long way of me saying, I don't have nearly as many examples as I might have hoped I would find. But if, we're, if I were to pick a 19th, uh, 19th century example, one of my favorite ones to pair alongside William Hay um, is the work of Harriet Martineau, um, Life in the Sick Room, where Martineau uh, talks all the time about how great it is to be in this position of repose and away from the capitalist expectations of improvement. And she says at numerous times, maybe I'm kind of okay with not getting better. And it, I remember having students go, what an awful way to think. Wouldn't you want to get better? You're actually in recovery and convalescence is this long process. You would want to get better. And my question back and something that I try to ask myself all the time now is why, why should we want to get better necessarily? And if, what is the cost of getting better? And in this case, it's about improvement, right? Um, so I, I think about how that continues to travel into the 19th century when disability will become attached to things like uh, factory accidents and actual categories that are then protected or in some ways neglected by government. Um, so that's that's where my mind goes based on your question. That's such a great one. Um, and, and part of me is secretly hoping that we'll come, we'll come up with a good bibliography of sources that are sort of understudied, especially life writing. I would love to hear more about life writing. Right, I think in this age of long COVID that that's uh, what if I don't want to get better, what if I don't get better is gonna be again, a really live and important question to ask. I've got a question from Declan, who would like, uh, Declan, do you wanna read your question or do you want me to read it out for you? So I've just been, um, maybe I forgot you to ask. It, maybe you read it out because I have a washing machine going here and it's quite loud. Okay, uh, Declan would, was wondering if you could say more about ableism and children in your research project. He's fascinated by this focus on the child and wants to know more about how enmeshed emerging white and bourgeois notions of childhood were co-developed alongside the governance of ableist thought. Put simply, does the birth of the idea of the child give birth to ableism itself? Oh my God, I feel like that's the beginning of an essay. Um, what a great question. Um, so I, I, I teased in the talk about my sudden need to think about childhood seriously, histories of childhood, but also uh, think about uh, queer and crip theories of childhood. And for me, when I was reading all of this really, really disturbing, but also um, salient uh, anti-vax propaganda in this period, I kept seeing this fixation on what now gets really sort of bandied about as the think of the children narrative. Uh, and anti-vaxxers love to say, oh, wow, you're, you're literally shoving 
uh, matter from an animal into your child, what kind of what kind of human will they be afterward? And the anxiety around something like cow mania, the idea that um, a, a child might actually descend into a bovine state, uh, parallel to me, a lot of the anti-autism discourses in anti-vax communities now, right? This idea that you they would rather their child be exposed to a highly communicable lethal disease naturally than to risk having their child live with a cognitive disability, right? Autism is seen as the foreclosure of a child's future. Um, and I, all the time, I quote that very, very disturbing moment where, um, oh my God, uh, what is her name? It's, got, it's escaping me. Um, she is a celebrity who was on Oprah. It'll come to me in a second. Uh, Jenny McCarthy. Uh, she says on Oprah Live, among all of the, the women who are present, many of them mothers themselves, uh, she says, uh, when I watched my son get vaccinated, I saw, the, I saw his soul leave his eyes, right? And this idea that the vaccination was a was the annihilation or assassination of the child's future. Uh, and I kept thinking about how much um, crip, crip theories of time uh, and queer theories of time in which queer and crip people are seen as without time or not having a future seem to play directly into this. Um, and to answer your question more directly, Declan, I will actually co-sign on that question that you're posing. Does the birth of the idea of the child give birth to ableism itself? I would argue that if we're trying to think about this in historical terms, I think the rise of the child's, the capacity for the child to be disciplined in the 18th century by education and by medicine, I think enables ableism in its most ideological forms. Uh, but that is me theorizing and gesturing wildly. Uh, so I hope in time, I'll have more sort of substantial ways of justifying that, but that is my instinct, absolutely, definitely. Thank you so much. What a wonderful question and answer. Yes, uh, Soren, do you want to ask your question or your comment? Sure, sure. It wasn't just meant as a sort of quip, although it is that too. <laughs> um, but Thank you so much, Travis, for I mean this wonderful uh, talk and 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 the the um, response to Declan that you just you just offered, and uh, and that makes me just even more confused. Then that you know, on, on the one hand, there's there's all of that that shoring up of boundaries and and, and ability and then, um, but then these same people have absolutely no qualms taking medication that has been developed for horses and, 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 and cattle, um, rather than, right? I don't want to go into down that rabbit hole, but how do we make that sense of, of all of this, these structures that, that, that are being set up around ability, disability, human animal, and yet then they're totally fine to turn around. Is it just cognitive dissonance or what is going on in terms of what you're talking about? I think your question makes me think about one of the great dangers, but also great affordances of the argument I want to make, which is to try to sketch out continuities between this 18th and 19th century moment and our contemporary moment. One of the dangers I've discovered is trying too hard to make that a connection. Uh, that in some ways, the kind of resistance to cow mania is in some ways parallel to the kinds of anti-vax reservations. What I will say is a key difference is the rise of what we now refer to as the medical industrial complex, right? And the rise of professional medicine. At this time, if you were to vaccinate your, uh, and by this time, I mean the 18th and 19th centuries, if you vaccinated your child, the risk of, uh, of side effects was quite high. Uh, and even mortality. Uh, uh, and I think that that's that was something that really weighed on families, especially as this procedure was fairly new. Uh, and that's not to say, like I, I want to be clear, I'm not advocating for an anti-vax position, but what I think really helped sort of perpetuate this notion of uh, you know, a resistance to something like cowpox was fears of uh, medicine's own. Uh, instability and its shifts during its moment of professionalization, right? There was a lot of quackery going on. So it was much more likely, right, for people to sort of challenge medicine 
but by the time we get into the 19th and 20th centuries, you will get this more quote unquote organized uh, and bureaucratic medicine that claims professionalism and distance, distance itself from quackery. Right, so I'm, I'm, what I love about this period is that we're in this murky territory where you can have a doctor like this doctor named Benjamin Mosley, who literally says, oh, well, um, your kids are gonna turn into cows, period. And that would have circulated with some intensity uh, and be used as a justification for challenging Edward Jenner's invention that it should be a national uh, technology. And I think that's, that to me is what's so interesting and so resonant, but a really strong reminder about kind of where we are now and where the state of medicine is now, if that makes sense. Right. Uh, Nikki Hessel had a question in the chat and then Heather's got her hand up. Hi, Travis. That was so wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I just, yeah, I just wanted to ask from the chat about how this changes or doesn't in romantic nation, notions of childhood, mm. um, which to sort of reify childhood again and, and think about free, natural, organic kind of life, but is itself ableist and, and setting up a norm of both physical interactions with the world, but also cognitive responses to the world? Mm. What a great question. I mean, I think in the field of romanticism, we've done a really good job sort of unpacking the ideological implications of this sort of free child. I mean, my favorite has been the people of Duncan on Wordsworth and how he celebrates childhood in the prelude. Um, but something that, I mean, to take your question very seriously, one of the things that I keep hearing now, whenever I read these romantic discourses on children as closer to nature or in some ways freer or more attached to nature, is this presumption of able-bodiedness, right? I, I think about how many disabled children there would have been um, and how many disabled children would have been in some ways neglected by this image, right? When you think about the, the children that these romantic writers were imagining, they're never disabled children. Um, and for some reason, and forgive me, maybe this is like my weird associative thinking, but I keep thinking about the poem, We Are Seven, and how it essentially is about death and disability, right? And, it, and so much of, what normative childhood is like is actually proximity to death and disability all the time. Um, so actually, how does that poem in some way set us up to think about normative childhood as a set of fantasies of improvement and development? Uh, again, a half-baked thought, but I couldn't help but think about it once your question came, came through. And I'm so glad that you're here. And thank you so much for being up so early in the morning uh, to make the talk. Heather, and then we'll go back to the chat for a couple questions queued up. Thanks, Travis, for this really thought-provoking talk. And thank you for mentioning Foote, who's just the perfect figure to talk about in relation to these, this uh, subject. And I'm just wondering about the figure of the comic genius and the potential for the disabled artist to disrupt this move towards ability. And I think, you know, Foote's so great as an example of this because his disability really enabled his, his flowering as uh, a comic writer. And I'm also thinking about Pope too, as someone oh, yes. who has this disabled body and that somehow works against this, this idea that we should improve because there's something about the disability that actually is generative, especially in terms of, of comedy. So I'm just, I just, I just, I don't necessarily have a question, but just sort of the idea of, of comedy and, and genius and ability and how that's all working together against the enlightenment idea of improvement and progress, especially bodily improvement. Mm, Heather, I, um, I have two ways of responding and I hope they get at something useful. So the first is thinking about, um, Foote's particular form of self-awareness, and I've been I've been really thinking in these recent years about um, Tobin Sieber's theory of complex embodiment, uh, thinking about how uh, we need to think about disability beyond medical model versus social model, but actually a kind of interplay of both. And something that um, Tobin really emphasized in his work was that uh, one of the key things that disability studies is teaching us to do is to think about 
uh, disabled people as capable of forms of knowledge making uh, and defined by a certain kind of self-awareness. And I wonder if that's actually the best way to think about Foot, right? Part of what makes his humor great is his intense self-awareness and his awareness of what makes disability funny. Um, the book that also, of course, haunts the, the, my, my, my memory of this particular way of thinking about things is um, Simon Dickey's book oh, sorry, on Dickey. humor. <laughs> yeah, the uh, chapter basically. But it is, exactly, right? The fact that Crip humor is in some ways an awareness of and a rerouting of uh, ableist jokes. That to me seems really interesting and something that Foote capitalizes on in such fascinating ways. Um, and I, I have to admit, because of my own limited work with sort of performance studies and thinking about the ways in which performance here undermines the, the, the supposedly cruel humor um, of, of sort of 18th century satire and ableism, I, I, I have to develop this more, but I can't help but think about um, Foote as a complexly embodied person who was extremely self-aware such that he used humor to kind of do a, um, a kind of crip educating of his audiences who were having to, in some ways, wonder why they were laughing at some of his jokes. Uh, and then his, of course, his later disability, I think, uh, only intensified the, the kind of, you had to be in on the joke or you were quite literally laughing for the reasons he was mocking you for. So that kind of meta joke is something that I'm really bad at writing about because when, when it comes to meta stuff, I feel like I never quite get that analysis right. But your question is helping me think about that. Um, yeah. I, I had another thought that it'll come back to me, but Heather, that's such a great question. And uh, thanks for that brilliant response. More to think about here. Always. I think we have time for one more question. And uh, Anna Guyen had a two-part question. Anna, do you want to read it out or? Hello. <laughs> Hi, Travis. It's Anna. Um, so as I wrote in the chat box, I'm. I'm quite interested in knowing what kind of text you're digging from the archives to tell your kind of intervention, because um, as you know, in this current disability studies and scholarship, um, a lot of it's focused on the medical or social model. So I wonder, when you're digging through the ar archives, what do you hope to what do you hope you'll unearth, uncover to offer in forms of a revision or intervention? Because um, I know they're not historians, but Alice Wong and as many ways of collective schizophrenia has come to mind that they have this kind of retelling of the women's bodies and how the medical establishments have um, historically failed, failed specifically women. Mm -hmm. mm. I'll try to answer this in a way that hopefully kind of expresses my own struggle being in the archive. Um, so to tell the truth, I haven't done as much archival work as I want to because I've often not felt welcome in archives, um, especially as a disabled person. Um, I'm, I also am legibly to most people not disabled. So whenever I sort of talk about accommodations, I feel like archives are not exactly the most welcoming spaces. Um, to, to quote Grayson Dillmeyer again, uh, Grayson did this interview of a bunch of scholars who uh, identify as disabled and what their experience of the archive is. And a, a running through line uh, in that inter set of interviews is that it's, it's such an ambivalent experience of trying to find yourself in the archive, uh, encountering disability and extremely tragic and devastating histories that are uh, very much alive in boxes that are never unearthed. Uh, but when they are unearthed, are traumatic in and of themselves. Um, there is this really beautiful moment in uh, Eli Clare's recent book, Brilliant Imperfection, uh, where uh, Eli reflects on the experience of uh, unearthing the history of Carrie Buck, uh, who was part of the uh, sort of legacy of American um, sterilization and eugenics. Uh, and Eli says at, at multiple points in there how painful it is to encounter um, one's own uh, kin in the archive and then feel in some ways responsible to tell that story because it needs to be told, but then to have to bear with its struggle. Um, and I, uh, I wrote in a different context, uh, an essay for The Rambling, where I talked about my very strange relationship to William Hayes' essay uh, on deformity, 
where I, I see it as such a defense of disability at a moment where I never thought there would be a defense, but it is also devastating to read William Hay's account of his own uh, experience of being bullied, mocked, and even trampled upon in London streets. Right, That to me is devastating to read, knowing that he suffered through a similar spinal curvature to mine. Um, so that kind of kinship and identification, but also uh, trauma and disidentification is so hard. Um, and I, I want to, I guess I focus on the subjective experience of that because I feel like it's not talked enough about. Uh, I feel like there's such a responsibility for disabled scholars to do that work in the archive, but it is in and of itself a difficult and painful experience. So when I try to find things in the archive, I have to be very careful about what I find because sometimes it's extremely painful to encounter, but what a great question. Thank you. All right, we are just about out of time. Can I just ask everyone to give a final round of applause to Travis uh, for his fantastic, wonderful talk. And before she disappears, I'd like also for us all to give a round of applause to Rebecca Bullard, who is the, the founder and uh, genius behind Odd Sex. Um, even though I am currently hosting, it is Rebecca's baby that I'm just keeping warm for her. So thank you, Rebecca, for making this place possible. And thank you, Travis, for kicking off this year's uh, series of talks so well. Please join us again next month when we'll be welcoming Rebecca Shapiro. Uh, you can book that now on Eventbrite. And um, I'm going to now stop the recording, uh, but the room doesn't close right away. So if you have any last minute questions that you'd like to ask Travis in a slightly uh, less panoptic place, um, you'd have an opportunity to do so.